This is Talking Drupal, a bi-weekly chat about web design and development by a group of guys with one thing in common. We love Drupal. Visit us at TalkingDrupal.com. This is Episode 5 of Exploring Drupal 8, Basic Concepts of Module Development. Hey, welcome back for Episode 5, everyone. Hey, Steve. So today we are uh, we're going to be talking about some basic concepts which um, of module development, which our previous episodes, to remind everyone, we're doing a, a brief Drupal 8 series, which is six audio video shows, uh, followed up by uh, two webinars, uh, which will be on January 12th and 19th, and you can sign up for them at exploringdrupal8.com. The first two episodes we discussed... Um, what's new in core. The third episode, we discussed theming. The last episode, number four, we discussed some introduction topics to module development um, for Drupal 8. And today we're going to be talking about some basic concepts. So we have with us uh, John Pacosi from Oomph. Welcome, John. Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us on a Saturday morning. I look forward to it every Saturday. We're doing this next Saturday too, right? <laughs> I don't think so, but uh, I mean, we are, John. We'll see you then. Okay. <laughs> and we have Nick Laughlin from Enlightened Design. Good morning. How are you, Nick? Pretty good. Looking forward to getting into some of these details. Uh, I've just been scratching the surface still, so looking forward to learning more about uh, routing, et cetera. Oh, great. We also have uh, Mike Marzavilla from Sago Solutions. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. How's and, it going? It's doing, we're doing well. And we got his partner in crime, Nick Salvaggio. Hi, Nick. Hey, guys. Good morning. So let's jump right in here to our basic topics uh, for module development. We're going to really touch on four key things, routing, forms, blocks and services. So let's jump right into routing layer. Awesome. So in our last, in our last episode, we talked about some of the basic ideas of, of Drupal 8, what's changing. One of the larger things that are changing within the context of Drupal 8 is how we define our routes. Now in Drupal 7, we, we really didn't use the word route. We said a menu entry. So the idea of hook menu where we created an array that defined what our what our menu entry was and we return that that's going away that has gone away in Drupal 8 so the first thing to kind of talk about is what exactly we're talking about with routing what is a route so the idea is we're mapping a URL to a piece of code that we've written that's really the core concept here so we we have some URL example.com slash hello and that slash hello is what our route is that URL is now going to execute some method within a class that returns some output to the browser. So at, at its core, that's what a route is. Very similar to how we, we thought about hook menu where we defined a, an array entry within an array that had a URL, a path, and it defined a callback. That callback was executed when, whenever that path was hit. The issue with hook menu was that it did a slew of things for us. It didn't just define that relationship of URL to some functionality within our software. It defined um, a bunch of other things like the, the menu entries, the actual menu entries within the menus in Drupal 8 um, and a bunch of other things. So the routing system now is focused more on just defining that relationship between URL and the code. There's some other things within the YAML files that we'll talk about a little bit. So this, this ties a little bit back to getting off the island, doesn't it? Yes, so exactly. So this is uh, the concepts that we're discussing here. This is part of the Symfony routing component. And you can, you can use this component outside of the context of Drupal. Um, I've actually tried to use it in a, in a few projects. I, I can't say for sure that I'm fully understanding how to implement it outside of Drupal just yet. But it is, it is an interesting project, and it's, you know, it'd be cool to kind of just play around with it. Oh, crap. So, so is it, um, so you're talking about things like you don't define permissions in the routing layer now, or access levels, or things like that, or 
is different. You, you do define the permissions in your YAML file. Um, so that, a lot of that stuff is still there. You're not going to define your menu links within the routing layer. That's going to be within a separate, uh, a separate YAML file. Um, so th the idea of a route follows the concept of develop a tool and then tell Drupal about it. And again, going back to this consistent API or consistent workflow that we're going to follow as developers, um, we're going to pretty much be saying this in each one of the components that we're talking about in this episode, which I think is a great thing because now we learn this and we can kind of extend that to everything in the system. So the idea of a route, how do, how do we actually go about developing a route? The first thing we're going to do is develop our controller. And a controller is the idea of a controller, I think has been pretty pervasive in other frameworks when we talk about MVC and things like that. So we would define our controller by extending a base class that's already defined within, our, within the core Drupal 8 system. That's the controller base class. We extend that, and then within that class, we can define methods that those methods would actually be the callbacks to our, our routes or our URLs that we define. So at that point, we have a class that we've developed. It's, it's in our module file, and it just extends a base class. At that point, Drupal knows nothing about it. It's just sitting there in a module file and it will not execute at all. The next step is to tell Drupal about it. So what we do is we define a routing.yaml file. That routing.yaml file has a bunch of different key value pairs essentially in it that define what that route is and how to execute that route. So we have things like the name of the route, um, the URL pattern that it follows, um, and some defaults for that, for that route. One of the defaults is the controller. So the controller is that class that we just extended from the controller base. And along with that, we define the method that should be called within that extended class. So that's kind of the core, that's the, the core of a route there. There's some really interesting things that we can do within this routing.yaml file. Things like, passing in parameters to our URLs, providing default values for those parameters, and even taking it a step further and defining pretty complicated using reg regular expressions, um, patterns that those, those parameters need to follow. So that's kind of interesting. So does that mean if we want to interact with somebody else's module, instead of hook menu alter, we'll just extend the class that they created? it overrides some pieces or that's a good question i think that pattern is gonna is gonna emerge over the next few versions i don't think we're doing that today within drupal 8 i think there is still the idea of uh the alter hooks um i know that's the case for the for the form api i'm not 100 percent on the on the menu on the on, on hook menu or the, the routing layer um I know with respect to forms, we still have to provide a form ID within the, the class, and that form ID is used within our form alter hooks. So the idea of these alter hooks still exist in Drupal 8. Okay. So once I've created, I'm, I'm creating a new module, no, nothing's going to be able to, I can't execute that or access it until I create that route in the routing file. Correct. Right. And that's, and that you said that's a YAML file. Hmm. Yep. Yep. Well, there's, two parts to it, right? There's a controller file and then a YAML file. Correct. Yeah. So your controller is really the, that's the code. That's going to be. Yeah. That's, that's the code that you built. Yep. But, but just by building that code doesn't mean anyone can access it until the routing is defined. Right. 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 Now, the interesting part about this too, is everything we're talking about does not require a dot module file. So for, for some contrib modules or some custom code, we don't even have to include a dot module file in Drupal seven. We required a dot info file and a dot module file at the very base to be able to define a, a module. Now all we need is a dot info file. Okay. It really, it's a dot info dot YAML file. Okay. And that YAML, this might be getting into the weeds a little bit so we can move on after this, but that YAML file is where controls all the YAML, all of the configuration for that particular module, or do you break up the YAML file sometimes? So with the routing, I, I believe you're defining all your routes within the routing.yaml file. 
There may be ways to split it up when you have a really, really big YAML file. I haven't seen examples of that yet, though. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. <clears throat> All right, so let's move on to forms. Cool. So forms follows a very, a very similar pattern. I think there's a couple of uh, interesting things that come out of forms here. In Drupal 7, and I'm sure we've all experienced this, the, the form API um, can become rather disconnected in our, in our modules. So we have the idea of the function that builds our form, the validator, the, the, the function that gets called before we actually say input data into our database, and then the submit handlers, which actually does input things into our database and execute logic based on the form inputs. In Drupal 7, those were really procedural functions that we defined within the context of our, our module file or our pages.inc file, whatever other file we wanted to put them in. The problem with that is that they were, they were procedural functions that were disconnected within, within our code. So a developer could, say, develop a, a form build function, say, at line one in, in a module file, and thousands of lines down, we can have our submit handlers and or our validators. So it kind of makes our experience as developers coming in and, and maybe reading that code a bit confusing. We have to search it a little bit more and all that type of stuff. I think the point there is that, that the functionality around a given form was not encapsulated at all within the context of itself. Hmm. So in Drupal 8, the, and leveraging the idea of object-oriented programming, we can encapsulate a form within its own class and all of the functionality that is part of that form is is visible and readable within the context of that class which i think is great and each class file represents its own form so we can quickly go into a module go into the forms directory within the source directory in our module and see a list of all the forms that that given module implements Oh, that's really cool. That's going to be useful. Yeah, so I, I think that's going to be great. Instead of going in and, and trying to read the module file, and where, where are these forms? Or, or just doing a I, – I frequently went in and created my own custom module and then just did like a hook form alter and, and DPM the form ID or something like that and just to see what, what form IDs were where on the page and things like that. Um, so we may be doing a little less of that in Drupal 8, it seems. So – Developing a form, a lot like developing a route, is, is very similar. So we, we have the idea of the form base class, which is part of Drupal core. And it's, it's really, there's a couple of base classes that we can use to, to develop form. But the form base, I think, is the one we should focus on here. It, you can extend that. And now that implements an interface that has all of the methods that we need to define to build our form. So we have a form build function. Um, the validate function, and then the submit handlers, all within a single class that we define. The form API itself, the actual process of creating a, an array with, with elements within it and, and the keys and all the values within it, that's pretty consistent to Drupal 7. So we don't have to relearn that. Hmm. So the forms are built the same way. Exactly. So the forms are built exactly the same. Render arrays, yeah, okay. Exactly, yeah. And this is, this is really how render arrays came about, right? I mean, the yeah. form API was before the, the idea of a render array. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think we, we have a couple of new elements. I think we could do some of the, uh, some of the things that we talked about in the site building course within, within the context of a form, so like a telephone field and things like that we can do. Um, and of course, we can still extend that to, to find our own elements within the form API. So, so someone, uh, so your code is going to be looking significantly different in terms of setting up a, a module from seven to eight in terms of even the first two things that we've discussed here, forms and routes. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, these, these two components that we're talking about there, we use them frequently, right? When we develop modules in, in, in a lot of cases, and they're going to be pretty different in terms of how we lay them out. Um, the context of forms we're laying them out differently, but we're defining them in a very similar way. Mm -hmm. um, routes, routes is completely different, though. We're, we're putting it on its head there. <laughs> well, what about in forms when you're writing a validator or um, writing the submit 
the submit um, functionality, are you accessing the form values in a similar way in Drupal 7 as well? Or is there, are there additional methods to say, I want the value for this particular f field and compare it? Yeah, that's a good question. So the, the form state, which is what's passed in that contains the values, um, is not an array anymore. It's, it's actually, okay. it's an implementation of an interface. So it's an object. And it's, it's, it's when we, when we define our submit handlers, we, we pass into it a form state interface. And that takes, that takes an implementation of that interface. And then we can access the values through that interface. Okay. So instead yeah. of like form state, you know, and then all that gibberish should be, you know, form state, then a form item you want and then get, and then you. Yeah. Yeah. So th yeah. there's an API around that. To, it's not going to be just indexing array values, but I think the cool thing about that is we're passing in an interface, not, not an actual uh, defined class. So that means we can define, we can pass into that any implementing interface. So I can kind of see a world where we're passing in just unique functionality within the form state interface that maybe there's a method that we're defining specific to our solution that we can call against the form state, to maybe do certain things to the form state. Okay. So instead of having to, so that will allow you to write more complex validations and just have a method that you call to make sure the validation works rather than having all that logic right there in the validator. Yeah, that's interesting. I think, yeah, that, that may be. So if, you, so if you have like a validation that needs to have, you know, for the telephone as an example, if you need to have a validator for, you know, English phone numbers or something, you can implement that class in one place and use that in every form on your site mm -hmm. rather than, all right, so you could kind of do that Drupal 7 already, I guess. Spread a function for it, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> but it's still probably cleaner to have a method. Yeah, now that, that, that may be a service, and we're going to talk about services in a little bit, but I think there's a couple of ways we can attack that. Okay. But, um, yeah, so that, I mean, that's basically forms, forms in a nutshell there. It, again, it goes back to that idea of extend a base class and then tell Drupal about it, or write a tool and then tell Drupal about it. So how do you tell Drupal about the forms? Is there a YAML file? Yeah, so yeah, that's a good point. There's really no telling Drupal about it in the form. You you would hook it up to a route essentially to tell Drupal. Okay. Yep. It's similar to now. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about blocks. Yeah, so blocks blocks are really interesting. We um this is the first uh, kind of introduction to plugins in our in our talks here. A block is not implemented through any info hooks anymore. Uh, a block is is a Basically, a, a Drupal plugin, um, and the the plugin system is defined through what's called annotations. So it, it's it's kind of interesting. There's a lot of um, a lot of chatter in the community about how this annotation system is working, but what um what it is is basically the the idea of build a tool and tell Drupal about it. It changes the tell Drupal about it section. Um, we would still write a tool which would still follow the same pattern that we're used to, which is extend the base class. In this case, it's going to be called block base. Um, and that block base has a couple of different methods that we need to implement through an interface. And same idea as the, the form where we, we build the block and then we render the block. The cool thing about this is just like the form, it's fully encapsulated within the actual class. So again, just like the form, we can go into any module and see a listing of all the blocks that that given module defines. So I think that's great because I know we, you know, in, in, in Drupal seven, we have the, the hook block, the hook block info and hook block view. And then in the hook block view, we needed to have a switch in there that basically said, Hey, what are you trying to render my block? If you are, then, you know, call this function to actually render what, what I want to render. That's going away with the block system in Drupal 8. That's good. Yeah, yes. I think that's pretty, pretty welcome, welcoming there. But the, the, the kind of interesting piece is the annotation. So a block is you tell Drupal about your block through an annotation in the, 
in the block class itself. So what is an annotation? Annotation is actually a, a comment in your code that is executable in a sense that tells, tells Drupal a, a couple of things about your block, things like the block name and the machine ID and things like that. What's the reasoning behind that? Uh, here we go. <laughs> this, is, this is a 20 minute show, right? <laughs> a lot of debate on that topic as to if it's good, if it's bad, why do it? So just, just, just so our listeners are clear on what we're about to talk about is that on uh, in the previous, at the beginning of the show, in the previous show, we were talking about YAML files are the way you tell Drupal that something's there really, right? Using YAML files to define things. Now for blocks, you're not using a YAML file to tell Drupal anything. Right. You're putting a comment in code structured a certain way that Drupal's looking for, which tells Drupal about it. Correct. Correct. And that, that idea is consistent for all plugins within, within Drupal 8. So it's not just blocks. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in the next episode, about the, the plugin system as a whole. So, so can, can you explain very briefly on why, do you know why annotation was chosen over any other standard method that we've already agreed upon here? Yeah, I'm not 100% clear. I mean, there's a lot of chatter out there and different issue queues about it. Um, I know it's leveraging the a piece of the doctrine project to be able to accomplish this. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think the Symphony project does leverage a lot of this. So I think there was a lot of idea sharing there with, with how this works. Um, I think combine that with the discoverability within the C tools plugin system. Um, those ideas combined with the doctrine system, I think meshed kind of well. And as a result, this solution came out of that. Um, it, it comes back to discoverability where we're not, I mean, we, we kind of are explicitly telling Drupal about it through these annotations, but in, in some respects, the, the plugin system is discovering any implementation of the, the interface through these, these annotations. So I, and the and the annotation is telling, isn't it telling the Drupal uh, admin tools that the block exists? Yes, yeah. So if you don't have that in there, you're not going to see your you're not going to see it in the block administration screens or anything like that. Right. So it's making it discoverable by the system. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So yeah. uh, let's hit our last topic, which is services. Yeah, so this is an interesting one too. And I think the, the, um, the term services is, is getting confused a lot in the community. When we, say, when we say services, a lot of people are thinking web services and you know, having some type of REST API or something like that around these services. We're not talking about that at all when we talk about Drupal services within the context of module development. Um, services basically, it's probably the simplest concept here um, it's basically just a class. You don't have to extend any base classes. It's really what's going to make your module specific. And most of the solution, the, the custom solution within any of our solutions is going to be defined within services. So, you know, things like our routes, we, we talk about a controller. We don't want to put all of our business logic within the controller. That may sound a little weird to us if we're coming from different environments because you know, there is, there is a lot of ideas where that's where your business logic goes within the controller, right? Um, that's not the case with, with Drupal 8. We want to, we want to break that out into services and a service. We want to make it as small as possible. And this kind of goes back to testing and we, you know, making our code as testable as, as possible. And traditionally by chopping down a problem into its least common denominator, it's its smallest kind of functional unit it makes it a lot easier to test our code. Um, so a service is really just a class that defines some functionality. And then we register that service. And here's really the, where it gets interesting is we register that service within something called the service container. And this is going to, this kind of leads us into the next episode where the service container is basically a, a, an object that keeps track of all of the services that are defined within the system and all other classes within the system use that service container to instantiate 
the services that are referenced within them. Are, are services like the public methods that are available to other objects? I'm, I'm trying to get my head around what exactly a service is different than you saying so, that the, the business logic doesn't go in the controller. It's going in a service, but what actually is a service? It's just a class, right? Just a class. So think okay. about it. We can, we can think about it in terms of like, um, what's a good example we can bring up here. Like I'll go back to the shape example I, I mentioned in the other, the other episodes, we can define a, um, uh, say a shape service and that shape service defines a couple of different methods for us, say calculate area. Um, now we can have a route that says calculate, calculate area and then maybe pass in a, um, a type of shape or something like that. Um, that controller, we can inject within that controller, the, the shape service and that shape service then exposes to that controller, the various methods such as calculate area, um, within itself. So now that controller doesn't have to implement the, the area mathematics that are defined within our service. And we can write tests. This is the important part. We can write tests directly against the service itself, not having to go into the routing layer. Hmm. Okay. Is that so if one, one controller could have multiple services associated with it, then we can test those services independently instead of everything just being in the controller. Typically is that a, Yes. So is the service container like a global Drupal object or is it specific to context? Yeah. So there's not a lot of, well, there, there is globals, but there's much less and you don't want to be using them. So things like saying global user and things like that is gone in, in Drupal 8. The, the service container is accessed in a couple of different ways. There is a global Drupal object that's available to us within our code that we can, we can reference any time. And within that object, we can retrieve the service container from that. Um, and then from the service container, we can literally instantiate any class that registered itself with the service container. Um, and within the context of controllers and some, other, some of the other components in Drupal 8, those base classes also have access to the service container. So we wouldn't be using the global Drupal object. We would be using the method on that base class. So in the context of a route, the controller base class has a method to access the service container. Does that make sense? I think I get it. Yeah. Yeah. It's coming together. I think we got, we got all thumbs up here. Okay, good. Awesome. <laughs> all right. Um, so that's going to, that's going to conclude uh, episode five here, building uh, some basic concepts for module development. Um, and we're going to move on to, our next show, which would be episode six and the last one of this audio series, really. Um, and we're going to be looking at some intermediate module development concepts. So um, if you've had your brain full already, just wait for the next 30 minutes. <laughs> um, so I want to thank uh, everyone for joining. As usual, Nick Laughlin, where can people find you online? You can find me online at Nick's Van, N-I-C-X-V-A-N. Pretty much everywhere. Great. How about you, John? You can find me at John Picozzi on all the major social networks. Awesome. I'm Stephen Cross at Stephen Cross with a PH, please, on Twitter. And uh, from Sego Solutions, we have Mike and Nick. Uh, Mike, tell us uh, where people can find you and what what you guys have going on over there at Sego. Sure. So I'm uh, M Mars Nine at uh, Twitter and. Um, all the major social, net, social networks. Uh, you can find more about uh, Sago at sagosolutions.com. And uh, we also have a, a platform that we developed called stackstarter.io. Um, check that out. Uh, we'll have a, a full launch of that uh, probably by the end of the year. And uh, Stackstarter is a, a tool to distribute uh, full development environments within the cloud. And you have a special uh, spin-up code for talking Drupal, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, I was gonna leave. I was gonna leave it for Nick. I knew he'd, oh, okay. he'd, he'd want to talk about <laughs> it. But uh, yes, we have a we have a spin code for for anyone that's uh, uh, listening to the shows. Um, it's uh, you go to stackstarter.io/spin and uh, enter talking Drupal, and uh, you can spin up your a Drupal development environment complete with console access and web-based IDE kind of get your hands into into Drupal 8 and uh, explore some of what we're talking about.
have here. Excellent. And Nick, how about you? Awesome. So, uh, pretty much everything Mike said, but with the exception of I'm at, uh, I'm at direct on Twitter. <laughs> All right, great guys. So uh, we will meet again for episode six. Talk to you soon. Awesome. Thanks. Bye.